Okay, well, welcome everybody to the latest meeting of Leeds Theosophical Society. Uh, we've been doing these Zoom talks now for around about three and a half years and uh, they're proving very popular and have even an international appeal. So there we are. This afternoon, I want to deal with something which I find absolutely fascinating. It's not something I intimately understand, but it's that process or that faculty called wisdom intuition, the sixth principle that we talk about in theosophy. Now, these days we tend to regard mind and intellect as the crowning achievements of human development. And in one sense, this is absolutely true. And it's been a very long and tortuous road turning humans into thinking beings. And let's not forget that in our distant past, it actually required extraterrestrial intervention uh, to cement the mind principle and stimulate the mind principle in humanity. You'll recall that during the third root race, when the process of acquiring mind somehow stalled, it took the Lords of the Flame from Venus, the Solar Petris or Agnishvatas as they're otherwise known, to give struggling humanity a helping hand in the mental dimension. Over the past few centuries, especially, the human intellect has undergone accelerated development. Um, until the 15th century, it's often said that few ordinary people really possessed anything that we would describe as um, an individualized intellect. At that time, the bulk of humanity shared a kind of group consciousness of the, the race, the nation, the tribe, the clan, or the family, and often with a heavy overlay of religious dogma as well. And indeed, this is still the case for many people. You've only got to look at mob violence or organizational groupthink or behavior at large sports events or political rallies or music events there is this kind of mob mind over more benignly you could call it a kind of collective consciousness human intelligence has really blossomed during the past 250 years of industrialization increased urbanization with people moving from uh, the countryside to cities in many countries of the world, along with improved education, uh, better health care, and increasing use of technology, especially in communications. You've only got to put this into some kind of context. During the time of William Shakespeare, who lived from before to 1616, the average peasant on the land is said to have had a vocabulary of around 400 words, which is like that of a small child today. When the United States Army measured the IQ of recruits when it went into the First World War in 1917, um, it found that they were pretty low. Uh, the average was something like 70. But 25 years later, when they measured the same kind of recruits in 1942 as they embarked on the Second World War, they found that there had been an increase of about uh, 30 points in the intelligence quo quotient of those people. And obviously in the intervening time, there had been much more communication, radio, cinema, and enhanced transportation. So this or something else had turned all these farm boys from Iowa into much more intelligent beings. They say that in the last 100 years, uh, human intelligence has gone up by an average of 30 to 40 points. So, of course, in this modern world of ours, as we see right now, communication is now instant, and if we want, it's global as well. And some people believe that this infrastructure is playing an important role role in improving human mental abilities. Other people disagree and uh, take entirely the opposite view. They believe that this technology may be having a damaging effect. 
And they feel that because this technology is now so ubiquitous and we're so dependent on it, it's actually harming rather than improving communications by polluting the planet with vast amounts of information, digi trash, if you want to call it that, and other low grade stuff. And there are also concerns that this stuff might actually be stopping people from using their minds because so many people become reliant on the technology and allow the technology to do the thinking for them. We've only got to look at artificial intelligence and many other things, which we'll deal with shortly. Uh, and this artificial intelligence is often cited now as the biggest threat to humanity. And ironically, this warning has come from people who were the very architects and, and the promoters of this kind of technology, such as the tech billionaire Elon Musk. And artificial intelligence may effectively become the guillotine of truth by the mass manipulation of information or deep fake videos or all sorts of other stuff that we're not even aware of yet. And then, of course, alongside all that is this terrible transhumanist movement, which peddles the absolutely ludicrous and absurd notion that human evolution and ability can somehow be enhanced by the supposedly imaginative addition of micro microcircuitry and exotic materials. Uh, it's becoming abundantly clear that technology which has been cooked up by the human intellect, is fast becoming mankind's jailer, especially when it's used for nefarious purposes, such as war, social control, surveillance, and so many other negative things. Now, defining exactly what the mind is has become one of the hottest and indeed most elusive topics in this burgeoning area of consciousness research. Materialist science, which is what most of science is, sometimes referred to as the new religion of scientism, remains very blinkered in this regard um, because it confines mind solely to the physical brain. And it regards consciousness purely as an epiphenomenon or a, a byproduct of the electrochemical reactions in the brain. So it can only define mind and consciousness in terms of physical infrastructure. It says mind cannot exist without a brain. Occult science, on the other hand, theosophy, the ageless wisdom teachings take a diametrically opposed view to this. So, despite being confronted by the weird world of quantum physics, which of course itself is based on non-material worlds, as well as superstring theory, which is based on the fact that there are numerous dimensions, and despite the mysteries of dark energy and dark matter, which seem to account for 95% of the universe, only a very few enlightened scientists are very slowly beginning to divest themselves of this exclusively materialistic paradigm. As we know, theosophy generally divides the mind into a lower mind of concrete, everyday, mundane thoughts, and a higher mind, which is capable of more noble things. It can conceptualize and deal with higher abstract concepts. However, there's an even more sophisticated human faculty than mind. Uh, in most people, this is largely dormant. And this is what we call in theosophy the sixth sense, buddhi, or wisdom intuition. The actual word buddhi is derived from the Sanskrit root word bud, which means to awaken or to perceive. And it's often slightly mistranslated as intuition, sometimes as reason, 
or intellect, but it's actually much wider than that. It has a much wider function. Um, it's a direct perception or awareness transcending rational thought. Madame Blavatsky, one of the founders of the Theosophical Society, described it as divine instinct. Now, when you look this up in the Theosophical Encyclopedia or one of the many other gloss glossaries, Buddhi is sometimes described as the spiritual soul, the operating vehicle of our highest principle, pure spirit or Atma in Sanskrit, which of course has no principle of its own. And it is the, quote, faculty which manifests as spiritual intuition, insight, understanding, all of which is far deeper and higher and subtler than our reasoning faculty. So it's above the mind. It doesn't require mind. It is a, another conduit of knowledge, wisdom and in, information. And it, it gets perceived in crude ways as a voice of conscience, a sense of right and wrong, as well as the ability to perceive and appreciate things like harmony, beauty, truth, and other timeless concepts like that. And reflected through the intellect, which in Sanskrit is manas, it's wisdom offering a kind of synthesizing and unifying vision as against the rather analytical and often divisive faculty of the rational principle. So when Buddha is dormant, the mind is the acme of human achievement. When Buddha is awakened and operating in conjunction with the mind, it becomes what we call the divine ego or the soul of theosophical teachings. And in its crudest form, as well as the things I mentioned earlier, it manifests itself as flashes of insight or hunches or gut feelings, but it's rather deeper than that. Um, Often when people do have these feelings, they have these flashes of insight or the gut feelings or whatever, they tend to mistrust them and dismiss them because they haven't been filtered through the rational mind. Now this, I think, is a big mistake because in many ways this is a purer form of perception than the rational mind by itself. Put the two together and you have something greater than the sum of the parts. So it's widely speculated by many people in the esoteric world that this sixth principle of wisdom intuition is now beginning to unfold in much larger sections of humanity. And it will further develop and will further appear with the emergence of the sixth sub-race of our present fifth root race in the coming decades and centuries. It's probably important to understand that small numbers, vanguard members of this new sixth sub-race are already in incarnation right now. And they will appear, I believe, in greater numbers. And eventually, far down the line, intuition will become the standard issue and fully functional sixth sense when we reach the sixth root race very very far into the future so it will be our sixth sense operating along our five existing physical senses of sight hearing touch taste and smell it's widely commented on that certain children coming into incarnation at the present time are starting to show much more developed intuitive faculties in terms of things like empathy and compassion. Sometimes they're referred to as indigo children or rainbow or star children. And many of these children seem to be very, very resistant to the traditional left brain means of classroom learning. And they don't cooperate with this at all well. 
And therefore, some are, and in many cases wrongly, diagnosed as having mental disorders of some kind, such as autism or attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Certainly, they don't perceive the world the way their parents and their grandparents did. So awakening, liberating, and utilizing this wisdom, intuition principle in humans will be a vital evolutionary leap forward because it spells a major uplift in consciousness, a consciousness which operates in conjunction with, but not at the behest of the intellect. And after all, it's intellect which has created and reinforced the prevailing materialistic paradigm which infects the world today. Um, this prevailing paradigm, you know, it's adopted universally by science and therefore by the majority of people. And this idea goes along the lines that there's only the physical world. Nothing else exists beyond that. This is the sole reality. And if you believe in subtle realms or mind beyond the brain, then this is just crude superstition or wishy-washy speculative nonsense. But this is beginning to change. A few enlightened scientists are beginning to go beyond this. And this is a very, very welcome sign. So wisdom intuition, when it develops, when it blossoms, it opens up entire new horizons of perception by energizing, uh, by enhancing the faculties of both imagination and inspiration. These things, imagination and inspiration, are very, very closely allied to the intuitional principle. I think people say, oh, it's just in your imagination, as if the imagination is something that we can just dismiss. The imagination is one of the most powerful tools that we as human beings possess. And developing that imagination is something which should be at the top of everyone's priorities. So when we open up this wisdom intuition principle, it revolutionizes consciousness. Uh, and it effectively opens the doors to the soul. Over time, this intuitive principle will enable human beings to transcend the three-dimensional, five-sense physical world and form links to the spiritual and super-sensible realms. And this will ultimately produce a new way of transcendent and spiritual thinking, something which was described by the German esotericist and former theosophist Rudolf Steiner a century or so ago as active, loving, spiritual, and free. And I think we could probably all go along with that. And Steiner believed that spiritual thinking, which employed imagination, inspiration, and intuition, was the central stimulus at the heart of all great advances in the world, in science, in art, in philosophy, in religion, and in other areas of human endeavor as well. So when we extend our consciousness in this way, we change the world. However, there will always be opposition to anything new, and especially to a new non-material, non-linear way of thinking. And this opposition will come from all sorts of vested interests, uh, not least science. And as is the case with all new ideas, and this has been true throughout human history, they're uh, at first resisted, mocked, derided, and dismissed by cynics, and the exponents of these new ideas um, are attacked, they're undermined, ridiculed, cancelled, and sometimes even killed. The next stage is everybody accepts this idea, and the stage after that is that how could we believe that we didn't believe this in the first place? So humanity seems to have a natural resistance 
to new ways of thinking. Whether this is the way we're designed, whether it's the way we're conditioned, I don't know. But, you know, it doesn't take the majority of humanity to reach any particular stage of consciousness, be it buddhic wisdom, intuitional consciousness, or anything else. Uh, you can still do this with comparatively small numbers of people buying into something like this. Um, and a change in consciousness amongst a comparatively small number of people can have a disproportionate and significant impact on the wider world when people work in close and focused harmony together. For example, followers of the Transcendental Meditation Organization, when they set up one of their places in a local area, they found that when they started their activities, um, even with only quite a few people involved, um, all sorts of things started to change. People started going to the doctors less. The police were called out um, on fewer occasions. And there was just a general sense of an uplift in well-being in that local community. And they found that it took only the square root of 1% of any given local, national, world population to achieve this. Well, the present world population rising all the time, but it's just over 8 billion people at the moment. 1% of that is 80 million. The square root of that is 9,000 people, which is the population of a small town. And it's far less than the worldwide membership of the Theosophical Society. So these changes of consciousness are extremely important and we can deny them or we can try to cooperate with them if we wish. And during this fifth epoch of the human race, it's all been about consciousness and how it's developed. Um, theosophy, unlike science, um, has a very clear idea of what mind is all about. And it has a coherent picture of what consciousness actually is. Science, despite all its certainties and apparent sophistication, and I have to say arrogance, still cannot define what consciousness is. And we, we can't say this too often. It can only define it in terms of the brain. But theosophists and our fellow travelers in other similar traditions have the distinct advantage of knowing that both mind and consciousness exist in non-physical realms. The brain is the seat of mind in the physical world only. And we know that aspects of consciousness not only survive the death of the physical body, but are eternal and destructible. Therefore, our higher minds are part of that enduring individuality, mind, wisdom, intuition, spirit, our lower minds are part of the transient personality, physical body, animating principle, astral body, lower mind. So for vast eons of human evolution, up to the fourth sub-race of this present fifth root race, uh, humanity did have a kind of spiritual intuitive thinking not as developed as it will be in the future, but a different kind, very different kind of thinking from the cold logical thinking that we have today. And as the civilizations of India and Egypt and Babylon, Chaldea, Greece and Rome crumbled, and as we entered the current fifth sub-race of the fifth root race, this spiritual intuitive thinking was largely replaced by increasing intellectualism and the masking of the more intuitive aspects of our thinking. Uh, of course, this was all part of the plan. But as I said earlier on, this pure intellectualism has been accelerated over the last uh, quarter of a millennium because of the huge industrialization which has affected virtually every country on earth by the huge shifts in population and by many other things. So consciousness is always something that is evolving 
And there are always in any group of people, be it a local, regional, national, or global group of people, there are always those who are much more advanced and further evolved down the line. And this is for obvious reasons. People are at very different stages of development. Um, so intellectual thinking is very much tied up with this material world, which we become impressive, uh, progressively enmeshed in over uh, the last few thousand years. Uh, but we are gradually beginning to move beyond this solely intellectual way of thought and synthesizing it with what we might call psycho-spiritual thinking and using these faculties of imagination, inspiration and intuition. The occult writer David Goddard put it rather well. He says, imagination is the tool whereby we become co-creators with the eternal. And that's a, a wonderful way of putting it. And so in the future, which we will be part of, you know, when we incarnate again and again and again, we are part of our own future. When we get to uh, that sixth root race, uh, humanity will have further developed and evolved this consciousness of wisdom, intuition. Um, the American adept, and uh, actually was a Canadian adept and writer, Manly P. Hall, and if you haven't read any of his works, please do, because they're absolutely fascinating. Um, he often pointed out throughout his works how attempts by visionary people to pioneer free thinking nearly always produces the same vicious response from the prevailing powers, be they secular or religious. And moving beyond the current ways of thinking and ushering in fresh ideas have always been attacked by three forces which are desperately struggling to maintain whatever status quo there is. And these are the church or the prevailing religion of the time, the state and the mob. And Shakespeare wrote a lot about the mindless mentality of the mob. And we see it, as I said earlier on, in collective human behavior today. You've only got to switch on your television any day of the week, and you'll see an example of this on the news. And throughout history, only a few individuals have really dared to challenge um, the prevailing wisdom. And when we look back at our history, we often find, not in every case, but in many, many cases, the prevailing wisdom of any given age usually turns out to be wrong or deeply flawed or whatever. So these few individuals who do try and pioneer new things meet this heavy resistance. Look what happened to Nikola Tesla. Had we backed him, we might have free electricity in the world now and not uh, be polluting the world with all the other means we need to generate power. Um, had we listened to people like Wilhelm Reich, the, uh, the man who developed uh, a machine to capture this natural energy, prana or orgon energy, he was reviled, put in prison and he died. You look at people like you know, Jesus, John the Baptist, Giordano Bruno, Galileo, and many, many others. Socrates, who was forced to drink the hemlock. Um, and, of course, these are just high-profile examples. And in any age, we see that people who don't toe the line, who want to do things in a new way, are always persecuted. Look at the millions who were slaughtered by the Catholic Church during the Inquisition in its attempts to suppress new thought forms. And yet, whether it is the, the church, the state, or the mob, like it or not, consciousness still continues to evolve, sometimes quite slowly, and sometimes, as in the modern era, very rapidly indeed. Um, and consciousness has certainly transformed over the last couple of centuries more quickly, probably, than at any other time uh, during human history or the human history that we're aware of. And yet this speed of transformation has brought with it its own crises, hasn't it? 
industrial and technological development has brought war, pollution, social dislocation, economic meltdowns, massive inequalities, resource depletion, and mass neurosis. That's the price that we've paid. The number of prescriptions in all Western countries for antidepressant drugs doubles about every five to six years. And so this long-held certainty that material wealth makes you happy, which is the center point and, and the central plank of virtually every political party in the world, this idea, the more you have, the happier you will be, is just looking a little tattered, frankly. And I think perhaps some of you may disagree. So shifts in consciousness, outwardly at least, have become generational. We don't think like our parents or grandparents did, and our children don't think the way that we do. Um, one of the important things to always remember, though, is the importance of free thinking. And I, I mention this an awful lot because I think free thinking in the modern world is under grave threat for all sorts of reasons. I think technology, I think a prevailing poisonous kind of politics and other factors are really starting to impinge on free speech. But free thinking and freeing up your mind and letting it progress beyond its materialistic prison, if we might call it that, is still a relatively rare phenomenon. It's something that we should all develop um, because it's essential if we're to regain and refine this intuitive faculty. But also, this area of wisdom intuition also applies to another very interesting area of research, which I've looked at in some depth over the last few decades. And this is what we might call, call psi research, such things as um, clairvoyance, clairaudience, psychokinesis, which is moving objects by mind, um, precognition, all these faculties which we know we have. And since the 1930s, they've been doing a lot of research into this. And there's clear research that these faculties do exist in people. One of the problems with doing research into this is if you put people in laboratories and put them in an artificial situation, their intuitive and inner faculties don't seem to work as well as they do when they're left to their own spontaneous devices. But nevertheless, they've conducted thousands of experiments over the last 70 or 80 years into this. Uh, people like Dr. Dean Radin, who is the chief scientist with the Institute of Noetic Sciences in America, has done a huge meta-analysis covering tens of thousands of these experiments. And the statistical proof is there, but science will still not admit this. It still doesn't like these ideas of telepathy and other non-physical things, which it can't explain except in terms of materialistic things. So what it doesn't like and what it doesn't accept, it simply dismisses. But the evidence is abundantly clear that humans have these faculties and they, <clears throat> It's not only human to human. Humans have these faculties to communicate with other kingdoms of nature too, be they animals that uh, we have as pets or uh, members of the vegetable and plant kingdom or even the mineral kingdom or even below that, the elemental kingdoms. We have these, these faculties. People do know before events happen. There is abundant evidence that people do have precognitive faculties. So this is all part and parcel of this new consciousness. Um, so just to wind up, I would say that our modern world um, shapes and enforces conformity to prevailing views just as much as the religions and the cultures of the past did. And we need to resist this. Uh, fundamentalists still rule the roost in many cases, whether it's in terms of religion, science or politics. And 
Fundamentalism is basically what happens when you forsake free thinking. It even happens, dare I say it, in spiritual organizations. Moving beyond the sphere of pure intellectualism and adopting more, as we've said, transcendent forms of consciousness is the challenge that we face right now and over the coming generations. Despite the huge changes happening all around us, this transition to a new form of consciousness will be a wonderful thing, but it will be painful and difficult. These days, we live in a world where there's very little of what you might call certainty or stability. Of course, as theosophists, we know that life never stands still for a single moment and everything is in a perpetual state of flux and subject to continuous and vigorous change. Uh, but the way things seem to me on planet Earth right at the moment is everything seems to be in the process of permanent deconstruction on a scale that we're just not comfortable with. We seem to be in a hyperactive part of the cycle when change has just accelerated to a dangerous breakneck speed. Uh, few people believe that they're in control of very many aspects of their lives. But of course, as people who are interested in esotericism, uh, we know that we are very much in control and that our thoughts actually create the physical world around us when we have an intuitive principle as well, that can be no bad thing. So although we live in this information-driven world fueled by the internet and TV and social media, um, the paradox is, and it's a big paradox, is that people are often more ignorant about themselves and the world around them than ever before. And we seem to have developed this technological tunnel vision um, and it's made us not more connected to the world or to ourselves, but more disconnected. So just to wind up completely, uh, at one time, it was always said that wisdom was reserved for the few. And this was no doubt true. And wisdom over time gets diluted into knowledge and knowledge gets diluted into information. And then this digital revolution of ours has just created this fog of data, which, which I earlier called digi trash, and we're just drowning in it. The wisdom's still there, it hasn't gone away, but in some respects it's harder to identify than ever because it's ingeniously disguised behind galaxies of competing data. So this is a clear case of not being able to see the wood for the trees. But just to recap, this process of developing this, you know, wisdom intuition, it might just start with us doing some meditation. It might even start with us just starting to daydream. It might just start with letting our imaginations run riot. Wherever it starts, wherever it starts, it's a very good thing and it can only help us on our onward journey. Thank you very much uh, for listening. You've been a, a wonderful audience, and thank you very much.